deeper at um, sort of the formation um, of Paul. Now, you may not know this, but before Paul really was fully released into ministry, so now I don't mean, he, we're going to see here in just a minute that he preached some sermons in Damascus, he shared with some people uh, the good news about God having saved him, but before he was fully released into ministry, do you know about how long it was? We're going to read, and I'm going to show you. But he actually spent three years in Arabia. And then he spent ten years in Tarsus. So it's 13 or 14 years from the time that this Pharisee of Pharisees, who would have had almost the entirety of the Old Testament memorized, by the way. So was he educated? Yeah. Did he know his scripture? Yeah. Was he therefore, according to most standards, qualified? Yes, and yet there's this huge gap of time, and three years, we know a little bit about what happened in Arabia. There's these ten silent years, and what I'm going to begin to unfold for you both this week and the next time I preach is to actually um, begin to think about the formation of what God is doing inside of uh, Paul as he, and even before he is fully released to be a proclaimer of the gospel of Christ. Does that make sense? Now, the idea there is that you're going to kind of do, um, I guess if we were in the military, it would be like an about face. I don't know if that's right or not. But the idea is you're going to take from the life of Paul, and then you're going to shift, and you're going to apply it to who? Me, your own life, right? That's, that's, the, that's the whole idea here. And the idea would also be that there is nothing, no matter how difficult, no matter how painful, no matter how disappointing, um, even no matter how joy-filled or exultant or happy, there is nothing in your life that is wasted if you're willing to bring it and surrender it into the Lordship of Christ Jesus and the formation that he is attempting to do in and through you. Yeah? So that's good news for some of us. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, before I start reading, let me just make a couple more comments. There's a guy that I love named Dallas Willard. He's no longer alive, but here's what Dallas says. If you don't come apart for a while, you will come apart after a while. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. If you don't come apart for a while... You will come apart after a while. Now, this is in stark um, sort of contrast to much of the way the American church, especially the non-denominational American church, and we're at the non-denominational church, but the way that we would do ministry. Because typically, someone comes to Christ, um, they're moving along in their spiritual journey. If they can talk well or speak well or if they sound good or whatever, if they have some giftings, we throw them up on a stage or throw them behind an instrument and we just let them go, Right? And the risk then is that their giftings run ahead of their character. You follow me? So, so the, a lot of times we assume that because someone has extraordinary gifts, that they also have extraordinary character. We also often assume that because someone has extraordinary gifts, that they have extraordinary uh, internal faith formation and Jesus formation inside of their being. What's interesting to me is it's clear that the Apostle Paul, or Saul, as he's still called in this moment that we're reading, had extraordinary gifts. And yet God saw fit to give him a 13 or 14 year time out so that he could forge and form the character inside of him through some of what he went through, some of his suffering, through some of his difficulty, so that when God finally released him into ministry, he wouldn't crack under the weight of it. Now, if you are aware of church over the last 10 years, we've seen all sorts of even moral failures and things that have come to light. And I am basically of the opinion, in, in pastors that is, but I am basically of the opinion that it all goes back to this. If you don't come apart for a while, you're going to come apart after a while. Amen. Amen. So the prayer as we open the scriptures today is, Lord Jesus, would you take us apart for a while. And would you give us even insight and understanding as to what you led the Apostle Paul through in these 13 or 14 years? Amen. 
So we're going to look into the deconstruction, probably, and then the reconstruction of the great apostle Paul. Now, let me just open my own sort of heart to you for just a minute. Um, One of, I would actually say, the greatest weaknesses in my own Jesus journey has been my lack of understanding around God's timing. I've often found myself in a rush trying to force the hand of God. Oftentimes, this has betrayed in me a belief that my time is better than God's time. That my ability, this is a a belief that I've probably labored in at points, or that my ability to build it or lead it or whatever is better than God's ability. So it it ends up in this internal state where you're in a rush, you're driven, it's, it's thing to thing, event to event, it's the next greatest thing, it's all about growth. And over time, what God has required of me is to shed some of my sort of overconfident, take matters into my own hands leadership style. It's very humbling. Oh, Jesus. If I continue to be just frank and open, I would say that I've often failed to admit that I am human and I have spiritual and emotional and relational capacity limits. I imagine you're similar. If I'm not careful, those beliefs drive me to work harder and harder. And if I'm not cautious, I'm actually setting myself to come apart after a while. I've spent much of my 42 years ignoring my human limitations and calling it strength, believing wrongly that God wants me to be some invincible sort of charismatic pastor that is more superhuman than human. I never forget because we were in a lead team elder meeting and Meg Jamelli, I don't think she's here today, I think they're traveling, Um, but she looked at me at the end of a, a statement or a thing and she went, oh, you are human. Thank you, Meg. If I further exposed my own heart and journey, I would say that God in his grace allowed a seven-year train wreck in my life from age 19 to 26, 27 that ended with the acknowledgement of my own weakness, my own failure, and my own inability to play God. It required that I come apart for a while. And I would even go so far as to say I'm still um, in the journey of being put back together. Somebody should say amen and take heart to that. Come on, we are all still in the Jesus journey and there's hope for people like you and people like me. It's good. Some of that for me required that I learn that his grace is sufficient for me, requiring uh, that his strength would be made perfect in my own weakness and failure. So here's where I am today. I'm learning to wait. I am learning to rest. I'm learning to abide in my Jesus. I'm learning to be still. I'm learning to pray. I am learning to humble myself and call upon the Lord to form me and to shape me even in the ways and through the circumstances that I don't like. I'm learning that the formation of Christ in me is more important than the perceived successes around me. I am learning that prayerless striving is dangerous. Now, let me flip this because we're about to look at Paul as he comes uh, into the faith. Um, He's called Saul here. He's going to, he's going to go by Paul later, but as he comes into faith and if we actually looked at his timeline and went, man, it was like 13 or 14 years before he's fully released into ministry. I think that many of us, especially with a ministry mindset or background, or if you've been raised like in the church, you might think, man, can you believe it? Paul wasted 14 years. He could have been preaching the gospel. He could have been out serving homeless people. He could have been out loving up. He could have been planting churches. He could have been writing books. He could have been writing epistles. He could have been, what could he have been doing? All the stuff, right? You hear me? So there's this, there's this elevation, and it's like, um, it's a beautiful thing about our American industrialized nation, but there's a danger because there's an elevation of what we can go do and achieve. And if we're not careful, we begin to make application from that into the gospel. And the gospel is the kingdom of God that supersedes way before what we can go do and achieve. Okay, So God's timetable, if we're willing to humble ourselves and be obedient to him, just like we're going to see Paul, who waits three years and then waits ten more and then is finally released into ministry. What's even fascinating about the timetable with this guy Paul is he was 
I, I mean, there's all these like thoughts and disagreements even over his age, but I would put him um, probably about 33 or 34 years old when he comes to Christ on the Damascus Road, which we just did in the last two weeks. Um, and then he has three years, let's say 34, and then three years, he's how old? 37, and then 10 more years, he's how old? 47. He didn't even really start until he was 47. And he is known to everyone in the Christian world around the globe right now, the finest teacher, any mind anywhere would tell you that the Apostle Paul was the one who shaped and formed New Testament Christianity, expressing the full sh- fullness of the lordship of Christ Jesus, writing about it, and then in many ways he became a shaper of the entire world as we know it, I would argue. And he didn't even get started until... Some of you need to breathe deep and go... I'm not behind. It's funny because I spent seven years in a dark place, which I shared a little bit about, but as I've come out of that, I have struggled at points with this notion that I'm behind or I failed or I'm late. Again, betraying my lack of faith in. Come on. Pastors have to repent too. Okay. Let's open this up, um, and let me make one more comment, just uh, theologically, if, in case you want to look any of this up. But must, most of my understanding of Paul comes from my own lens, my own experience, how God has saved and rescued and redeemed me. But then my reading comes from Dr. Kenneth Bailey, John Stott, William Barclay, N.T. Wright, Warren Wearsby, and John Pollock. I just want to throw that out there. Those are a bunch of ones that I love um, on the Apostle Paul. So we're going to start and we're going to read Acts 9 starting in verse 18. And let's see what the Holy Spirit will enliven us with today. Verse 18, immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. Now remember Ananias has just come in. Only time we hear from this Ananias in the entire Bible. Something like uh, scales fell from Saul's eyes. So he couldn't see literally, but now he can see spiritually. All of a sudden, his literal sight is also restored. He got up, and he was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, I just I want to make a couple statements here on baptism before I continue reading. Um, baptism is the new life of Christ. Um, so so just, let, me, let me just open this just quickly for us. Baptism, the entire act of baptism, after you surrender your heart and life to King Jesus, baptism is the act where you're actually dunked usually underwater. You can't have water poured over your head, but you're dunked underwater and then you're raised up. And that's symbolic, just like King Jesus was crucified on the cross. He was dead and buried in the ground. And then on the third day, he rose. So when we rise up from the water, it's like we're being resurrected with Christ Jesus, the old self, the old us. uh, Sarks is what Paul would have called it it in the epistles. Our flesh is now no more. Um, And and we are, we have been crucified with Christ. And now the newness of Christ rules and reigns in our body. Now, the thing is, there's still a sin principle that is still alive in us until the day we cross the threshold into eternity. Okay. So do Christians have the capacity to sin? Yes, absolutely. So baptism doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. It just means this is the larger theological framework that the old person has been washed away. The new person has come. And in many ways, this 13 or 14 years that we're going to look at in Paul's life is when he worked out the life of Christ as Christ worked the life of Christ in him. Does that make sense? So... Um, You could look up Romans 6, 7, and 8 if you wanted to look at that a little bit more. But uh, Saul, or Paul, is is working through the reality that he's been delivered from the law of sin and death, purchased by the blood of King Jesus. He's now been baptized, or if we wanted to use a cruder word, you could say branded as a Messiah person, as a Jesus person, um, into the one God, Yahweh, of the Old Testament, who's now being revealed as Jesus in the New Testament. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what baptism essentially is. It's the new life of Christ that must be worked out outwardly as God works it inwardly. Okay, let's keep going. And where were we? 19. After taking some food, he regained his strength. He hadn't eaten or or drank anything in three days. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, now this is where people get a little bit tripped up, uh, but verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. 
So what's it once mean? Immediately. Okay, so verse 21. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who called on this name, Jesus? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief of priests? Verse 22. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful as he baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 23. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. Now, here's what I can't fully unpack for you, but here's what I know. If you read anybody's interpretation or view of history, guess what's left out? A lot of the details, right? There's a lot of little things left out. So Luke, and we don't fully understand this, but I think Luke, not wanting his epistle to go on and on forever and ever and ever, um, left out that somewhere in here, um, Paul actually leaves uh, Damascus for three years, and then he comes back to Damascus, okay? So flip with me to Galatians 1, and we're going to unpack this. And as we unpack it, we're going to sort of talk about um, the persecutor that becomes the proclaimer. That's Paul. We're going to talk about this idea of the modern therapeutic self. I'm going to dip into something. You're going to go, what? Okay. Um, And then uh, we're going to talk about Paul's doubt, because I think Paul doubted. He had a crisis of faith, I believe. Um, And then we're going to ultimately talk about how he went to Mount Sinai um, in Arabia for these three years and what may have happened during that time. So flip to Galatians 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 14. Okay, now this is years later. Paul is penning this about the time when he came to Christ. Uh, Galatians 1, verse 14. I was advanced in, advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age and my people, and I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. I, a couple Sundays ago, we talked about that, connecting in Paul's mind his call to be like Elijah the prophet in the Old Testament. Verse 15, but when God, who set me apart from birth. Now, this is, um, this is a, a full and total, um, uh, he, he's, he's quoting Jeremiah, okay? When Jeremiah talks about Jeremiah the prophet. So as he's writing to the Galatians, it's really, he's really interesting. He is um, already likening himself, Paul is likening himself to Elijah, extremely zealous. He's likening himself to um, Jeremiah, right there, verse 15, and called me by his grace when when. Uh, he was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. My immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. Later I returned to Damascus. So let me, um, I I guess, just kind of make a couple of statements here. Um, when he says God set me apart from birth, he's referencing Jeremiah. When he speaks of God unveiling the sun in him, I don't have time to unpack it, but he's referencing both Jewish, Jewish mystics and seers who spoke of the unveiling or the revelation as constituting a divine call. So he's basically writing out that he has a divine call. And not only that, but he didn't get his gospel from any of the 12 apostles or the disciples in Jerusalem. Rather, who gave him his gospel? Right from God. Fascinating. Um, <clears throat> and then if I, well, let's keep reading, and then I'll go back. All right, verse, uh, verse 18, we just finished 17, I went into Arabia, and later I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, and I stayed with him 15 days. Now, Cephas is Peter. Let me back up to verse 17, because this is a touch confusing. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to where? Arabia. Then later I returned to Okay, now, you don't have to flip back, but I'm going to in Acts. So I would say to you in Acts when it says, we just read it, but in verse, uh, coming out of verse 19, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Probably right there, um, maybe after verse 20, at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus was the Son of God and that all those that heard him were astonished. Somewhere right in here, Saul uh, actually goes to Arabia for three years and then he returns to Damascus, the place where it all began. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's keep going. And this is hopefully going to come together for you. 
Verse 19, I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you uh, before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. Then I went to uh, Syria and Sicilia, and I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea um, that are in Christ. They uh, only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. That's, an, that's a reference, by the way, to Exodus, or not Exodus, of, um, to Isaiah. 49 verse 3 if you want to make a note and look that up but then verse uh, chapter 2 begins then after 14 years look at that I went up again to Jerusalem this time with Barnabas and I took Titus also I went in response to a revelation and uh, meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders I set before them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles I wanted to be sure that I was not running and had not been running my race in vain okay let me see if I can tie this together so what is he saying so when you put together Um, Acts 9 and Galatians 1 and 2, what you begin to see is Saul came to Christ in Damascus. He was baptized in Damascus. He did a short bit of preaching. I'm going to suggest that he probably had a, a simultaneous crisis of faith or doubt, and he had to go back to be sure that this Jesus was, in fact, Yahweh God. Because remember we talked about if he came out and said Jesus is Yahweh God, then he's going to lose potentially his family, his friends, his standing, his finances. He's, he's up to lose everything. And not only that, he's going to take all of Judaism as everybody knows it, and he's going to like flip it over. And instituting Christ, he is going to absolutely do damage, uh, wrecking havoc on Judaism as they currently knew it. Does that make sense? That's why we're not in here as practicing Jews. Rather, we're practicing Christians. Okay. So he then comes to Christ, and somewhere in those first few verses, he goes down, or down to Arabia. And then from Arabia, after three years, he comes back up to Damascus. And then he goes up to Tarsus for ten years. We're just going to talk about the Damascus three, is what we're talking about this morning. Okay, so... Um, what, what I want to first open up is this is the persecutor. So Saul, the persecutor of the church of Christ, suddenly becomes the proclaimer of the church of Christ. Um, so, and I, I, the reason I even am opening this up is because I'm not sure that we as New Testament believers can even understand this complex man who would go on to shape a worldwide movement without understanding what transpired or what may have transpired in those uh, three years. So, now let me open up a whole other uh, idea for you. <laughs> in the time where he goes um, down to Arabia, and we're going to talk about why in the world Arabia in just a minute. But in, uh, in Arabia, he goes um, back to a mountain, I believe, called Mount Sinai. That's coming out of Galatians uh, 4.24. If you want to make a note, you can just trust me if you don't. Okay, so he goes back, he's going to go back to Mount Sinai. Now, just quickly, what happened at Mount Sinai? Also in the Old Testament, it's called Mount Horeb. There's some disagreement among scholars among where it is, but Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are synonymous. Okay, what happened at Mount Sinai? Ten commandments were given by Moses. God descended on Mount Sinai. It was known as the mountain of God. He lingered over the mountain of God. And Moses from the Old Testament would go up into the presence of God. And he ultimately, God ratified his covenant with this Jewish people. And Moses came down and brought the Ten Commandments. And then um, the, the Levitical laws that are also written in the Old Testament. Okay, so... Paul, or Saul if you prefer, um, after he comes to Christ, he begins to preach. I believe, and it's not fully in the text, but I believe that he had a little bit of doubt or a little bit of question. And he was such a detailed, resolute person. He wanted to know that this was the truth, that I think he had to call a time out and go, I cannot in good conscience preach anymore that Jesus is the Messiah. I have got to go back to where it all began, which was Mount Sinai. So I'm going to go back to where all of this began, to where God first revealed himself to Moses. uh, And I am going to check in with God and make sure um, that this is the right thing. Now, I want to open up just a a side thought here um, because I think it's very pertinent to even where we are right now. In 2023 America, there's this idea of the therapeutic self or the modern self. Um, here's how I would even uh, sort of um, define it, but it's this idea that you can create you, you get to do you, you choose your own identity, and to me, all of that harkens back to original sin, Genesis 2 and 3. 
So in other words, if you go back to the garden, Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you get this idea that the forbidden fruit reveals to Eve and to Adam this idea that they can self-define, they can sort of choose their own path, choose their own adventure, um, and they in some way get to become like God, determining good and determining evil. Now, Mark my words here for a minute. There is subtle truth here, but there is also um, deception that can shipwreck the human soul and isolate a person from Yahweh God both now and into eternal darkness. This is in stark contrast with what I see in the Apostle Paul because he goes, he recognizes he does not have the right to self-define. He recognizes he has very little rights at all. He surrenders all of his Pharisaic training, his calling, his finances, everything that he has. He's carrying papers um, that would have been from the chief priests, from the great Sanhedrin, from their Supreme Court. And I, you know, one of the things I would love to know is when I get to stand in the presence of the Apostle Paul in eternity when we're with Jesus, is I want to know, what did you do with those papers that said you could go kill all the Christians and persecute them and beat them and put them? Did you burn them? Did he walk out back and, you know, did he burn them? Or, or did he carry them as a reminder of what God had delivered him from and even delivered him to? Remember we just read, he, had, he was literally carrying papers that said that he could go and persecute and tor torture and hurt and abuse and even kill. So one of, these, one of these things that I've wrestled with is Paul recognizes that he has no right to self-determine. He cannot choose his own identity. He doesn't have the luxury, if you will, of sort of doing him. Um, so therefore, he actually says, i got to call a strategic time out and I've got to go back to where all of this began, which is at Mount Sinai. And so this is now Michael's conjecture, but I believe what he did is he went back to the mountain of God. He went back to the original place of God. And it says for three years he was there. Three years. Perhaps waiting on God, perhaps praying. He would have had the entire Torah and Old Testament memorized, perhaps looking through the scriptures, perhaps having um, a confrontation with or an encounter with this holy God. So he goes back to Mount Sinai to determine the place where the covenant um, of Yahweh God was ratified with Moses, I believe, to determine and to verify that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the one God, Yahweh, um, that, uh, that Jesus had just revealed himself to Paul as being. Does that make sense? What I love about this is you actually get this idea that um, Paul, he's so studious, he's so diligent, he wants to make sure he is totally accurate. So before he goes around parading this new fancy notion that he's got, that Jesus is the Messiah, he's going to go back and sit and wait in the presence of God back to where it all began. And he is going to let God determine his identity. He's going to let God fashion his person. He's going to let God form him inside and out. He is going to even and go through the spiritual disciplines and the journey of becoming the person that God has called and created him to be. Amen? Okay. Let me, let me just say this in, in the process here. Um, do you remember the story in, uh, I think it's Luke 10, but where Mary sat at the feet of Jesus? Remember that? If not, you, or if you're not a Jesus person or a church person, that's fine. You can look it up if you want. But it's in Luke 10. Um, but a, a, a disciple sat at a master's feet, a, a rabbi's feet. And that posture, um, what that represented is that person would have been learning from the rabbi. Okay, So Mary's posture was one of Mary being discipled by Jesus. Um, so her sitting at his feet is like sitting at the feet of a beloved teacher. So I would say to you in the same way, when Paul goes to Mount Sinai, his posture is much much like Mary, it's this rabbinic posture, I, I have come to sit at the feet of the rabbi, of the master, of the creator, of God. And I am going to sit and I am going to wait at the feet of the rabbi, the master, the creator. And I am not going to get up in presumption or assumption that I am ready to proclaim the good news of the gospel of Christ Jesus until the king of kings and lord of lords says, arise, my son. Go, therefore, back to Damascus. Now... It's the only place I can even see a little bit of Paul's doubt, but I actually love to see that he probably had some doubt. He chose to go back in obedience to the Lord, I would say, um, to Mount Sinai in Arabia. Isn't it good to know that people like Paul have doubts? He's human too, just like 
You and me. Okay. All right. <clears throat> why in the world, we've already begun to touch into this, but why in the world would he go to Mount Sinai? Um, so Yahweh God, the God of the Old Testament, revealed himself in the New Testament um, at Sinai, and then eventually he revealed himself as the temple um, was built by, by Solomon, David's, uh, King David's son. You can look all this up if you like. But in the temple was the place where the person of God, um, the people of God, and the word of God intersect. Does that make sense? We've, we've talked a little bit about this if you hang with us a lot, if you're a regular member here. But at the temple was the place where the person of God, the people of God, and the word of God sort of all um, uh, intersect. And when Jesus was crucified, you remember what was torn? The, 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 the curtain was rent, um, not from bottom to top like humans would do it, but it was rent from top of this huge um, facility all the way to the bottom like only God could have done. And what that symbolized was that the presence of God, so the place of intersection between the people of God, the presence of God, and the word of God, no longer dwelt in a building made by human hands. But now, who became the temple? Us. Okay, so as, um, this, as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords sort of erupts from the temple, taking up his place inside humans, um, and we become <clears throat> the temple of God, uh, so then um, Paul goes back to this place where it all began, and you can read all about it in Exodus 32, 33, and 34, if you like. Some of my favorite chapters in the Old Testament. Now, I would suggest to you that the Apostle Paul, this is Michael's conjecture, but I would suggest to you that he went back to Mount Sinai to turn in his Pharisee badge. Yahweh God, my Pharisee badge. And he's going to get the Apostle Paul badge, King Jesus. He gets the infilling power of Jesus, but then he also gets his unique call as the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to also cross something here because we've talked about Elijah. I realize I'm, I'm throwing you in the deep end this morning. So if you're new here, I'm sorry. We love Jesus. We love scripture. We're digging in. Um, but I'm going to read. You don't have to turn here, but if you want to make a note, it's worth um, taking the time to study and look at. But in 1 Kings 19, it was actually in our one-year Bible reading this morning. I love when that happens. But 1 Kings 19, verses 15 and 16, this is Elijah. Um, this is God speaking to Elijah of the Old Testament. And here's what he said. The Lord said to him, now, coincidentally, do you know where Elijah is in this passage? Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb. And what's the other name for Mount Horeb? Mount Sinai. Where is the Apostle Paul right now? Sinai in Arabia, according to Galatians 4.24. So, now, back to Elijah. So, uh, Elijah in verse 15 is where? Mount Sinai. Okay. So, the Lord said to him, Elijah, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Anoint Jehu king over Israel and anoints Elisha to secede you as prophet. Okay. Paul goes back to the place where the covenant of God was originally ratified. This one God made his um, bond of covenant to the Jewish people. He goes back. He sits at the feet of Jesus as a disciple would sit um, at the feet of a rabbi. He trains under him. We don't know all that that entails. And then I would say to you at some point, God is speaking this even passage and idea because it bleeds through in Galatians. I've pointed out to you a couple spots. But, but I believe what begins to happen is uh, Paul, by revelation from God, begins to see himself as a new version of Elijah. And God says to Elijah, rise up from Mount Sinai and go back to Damascus. And in Damascus, what are you supposed to do? Anoint a king. Paul. Rise up from Mount Sinai. Go back to Damascus and proclaim the king. So Elijah is in some ways, and Paul begins to see himself as this new um, version, but he's carrying the anointing or the calling or the something of some of the Old Testament prophets, and he is literally seeing himself just like God said to Elijah, arise up, go back to Damascus and begin to herald the new king. He's saying to Paul, rise up, get off the mountain, the time has now come to an end, go back to Damascus where you had this experience with me, and now herald the new king. King Jesus, Lord of heaven and earth. 
And so Paul gets this full call where he is like, oh my goodness, I am now called to carry this message of the king, king of kings and lord of lords, not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. And his entire job, his whole job description is go and herald the king, King Jesus. Now, what I can't fully unpack here in these moments is what happened in those three years. But I would suggest to you there was probably prayer, there was probably fasting. I would suggest to you that he still had to eat. And anybody know Paul's trade? Tent making, he's probably sitting at the feet of his Jesus on the side of Mount Sinai. And at points, he's probably actually working with leather. He is sewing leather. He is making tents. He may even have to journey into little villages to sell his tent so that he can make some money, so that he can eat. And so he goes back and he just sits at the feet of this Jesus. But what I absolutely love, and I don't know if I can even fully put it into like human English words, but what I love here is this idea and revelation that begins to be revealed about Yahweh God. And here it is. He is not in a hurry. He is not in a rush. He is not wringing his hands over your life or mine. There is something that he is carefully and slowly and lovingly unfolding. And if you will begin to get with him in the process, there are these supernatural even rhythms and ways about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And if you'll stop fighting with him over it and more begin to surrender to it, stop white-knuckling life and begin to live open-handed, all of a sudden there is this transformation that begins to happen inside of you where you can begin to experience the love of this holy God the kindness of this holy God and then all of a sudden you can begin to see what happens in your life or what doesn't happen and your hurts and your disappointments and your successes and and those that you have lost and and all the stuff in your whole experience as something that God is using to form you and to shape you and even to help take you apart so that you don't come apart you don't come apart for a while, you will come apart after a while. Next week or the week after, we're going to take a look at the silent decade of Paul's life because he's now coming from Arabia and he is now coming back to Damascus. And in Damascus, what's he going to do? Herald the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So I believe when it says in Acts 9, verse 20, Luke didn't record it all, but it said at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Come on. That may have been after his three years. And all those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem? among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as his prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. This Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This Jesus is calling to you calling to me, calling to any who will respond to him to enter into the deeply formed life of Christ. Christ doesn't just want to save you. He doesn't just want to get you into heaven. He wants to get heaven into you now. He wants you to experience the joy and the peace and the life of Christ now that transcend all human circumstances, that transcend all that you have lived through. Here's what I'd love for us to do. Prayer team, would you guys be willing to come up? Let's all stand together as they are coming. If you need special prayer, this is a group of people up here that love Jesus. I guess they're still coming to this side. But this is a group of people that love Jesus and they're in the journey, just like you and just like me, 
if you have a need, if you have something heartfelt, if something is on your mind, we would love to pray with you. We believe in a God that if you care about it, He cares about it. In the meantime, we're going to close with a worship song, and I'll get up here and close us out in prayer. This also, the floor right here is open if you just want to come and worship before Jesus. minutes early and I want to do something unusual this morning. Um, I've got a good friend that just came up and he lost his dad a year and a half ago. And today is Father's Day. Remember how we opened? We said that this day is painful, it's joyous, it's wonderful. If there is a unique um, father hurt, father related hurt in your life, maybe you've lost a father, maybe you've been abused by a father or a grandfather, um, maybe you've been abandoned by a father or a grandfather. Maybe you have children that you've lost as a father. Uh, anything father related. We've got a few minutes here. I would love to sing this again. And would you be courageous enough, any of you who would go, man, I have got a father thing inside of me. Men, women, children, it doesn't matter who comes up. But would you be willing, can we just pray just as a church? Anyone who would be willing to say, hey, that's me. It's a courageous ask, I get it. team and anybody else who feels comfortable just come on up we're just going to ask the lord jesus to touch that father spot whatever it is whether you've lost a father you've been hurt by a father you're a father that's lost a child i don't know what it is but whatever it is let's just go to the king of kings let's sit at mount sinai if you will and allow the king of kings and lord of lords to minister to our hearts to heal us and to raise us up to life in christ can we do one more
pray on this Father's Day that you would work through every human heart. Father, would you touch us? Would you transform us? Father, would you allow us to be a people that, like the Apostle Paul, learn to sit at your feet, not to work for, not to rush and run ourselves ragged, not to have expectations of ourselves that are unrealistic. Father, for those of us who have images of you or views of you as an evil taskmaster, Father, would you, by your grace, tear those down? Would you allow us to know you as Lord, as Savior, as Father, as kind, as loving, as gracious? Lord, I pray as we go from this place today that we could sense your hand upon our lives. Father, I pray that we could find your voice amidst the storms. Father, I pray that you would teach us as a church to sit at your feet, abiding in your person, progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with you. Holy Spirit, we give you free rule and reign of our hearts and lives. And just like you fully formed the Apostle Paul, would you form us? And Father, would you give ourselves, would you give us grace for ourselves in the areas that we're not yet fully formed? Lord, we love you and we praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. As you go today, may you know the love of Yahweh, Father God. Amen.